Hey everyone, Rua here with another job guide. Corsair has been an often requested job for me to tackle, and I think the time's right for me to finally do so. Corsair has been around since the treasures of our Terragon expansion, but it's really come a long way since it first arrived. If you're a new player, or one that's recently resubbed to the game, you might be taken aback at just how different the job looks and feels to pretty much anything else out there. I'll be sure to cover the key bases in here, in case people want to pick it up. So, let's get into it. The old adage was that a Corsair is a hybrid of a Bard and a Ranger, and that it's a support role job with a helping of DPS thrown in for good measure. There's more to it than that, but the adage does hold some weight. Corsair stands apart from other support role jobs, and that its support doesn't come in the form of songs, enhancing magic or geomancy, but rather from job abilities. It uses three main weapon types, swords, daggers, and guns. It has lower skill in these classes than pure DPS jobs, but it can still make really good use of what it has. Corsairs have a lot going for them. Their line of buffs, phantom rolls, are generally unique and cover the bases other support jobs can't. Sure, you've got your staple fare like accuracy and attack bonuses, but then you have your niche effects like store TP from Samurai Roll, which is hands down one of the best melee buffs in the game. Not only that, Chaos Roll's attack bonus is really strong, surpassing an Idris Geomancer at its absolute best. Seriously. A Corsair's rolls are also the only thing in the game capable of directly buffing pet jobs, and given the current prevalence of summoners, this comes in very useful. Corsair is also the only job in the game capable of resetting job ability timers in the heat of battle, something that can save lives and can make the hardest battles a lot easier to handle. It can even reset the SP abilities, 1 hours, of its party members for its own SP and wildcard. That alone makes it one of the best SPs in the game if you ask me. Offensively, the Corsair packs an almighty punch for a support role job. It has the highest DPS output of the category, outdoing bards and geomancers with ease. It's not even close. This is because a Corsair covers all three damage types with its melee attacks, ranged attacks, and elemental weapon skills. Among these is Leaden Salute, an absolutely devastating attack which can blow monsters away if properly geared for and supported. Corsair is also a welcome addition in mage groups, as quick draw can boost both enfeebling and elemental magic, as well as contributing some more magic damage while not getting in the way. So what you've got here is a support role job with something for everyone. Since it can cover so many bases and support so many different group setups, it's a very welcome addition to endgame content. Finally, the main reason it's largely invited can be grasped quickly by new players, so it's an excellent choice for those looking to break into endgame, or at least to get started. Corsairs also have a lot going against them. To the point, this is a job at the mercy of chance, and chance is, well, unpredictable. If you don't like working against the random number generator, or praying daily to RN Jesus, then steer well clear of this job. The trade-off for Corsair having such high damage output comes in the form of it lacking any form of a haste buff, which is the most important buff in the game. Add to this the fact that it can't directly enfeeble its targets itself, instead only being able to boost other spells, and you have a support role job that can't support a group by itself. Bards and Geomancers can do this, a Corsair can't. While it's a capable DPS, the Corsair has the lowest combat skill ratings of any job that may find itself on the front lines, something which really shows in high-end content when you have to go out of your way to compensate for the relative lack of skill and what that entails. Compounding this further is that a Corsair is a definition of a glass cannon, which means although it can deal high damage, it also takes high damage. Corsair has the evasion and defences of a ranger, yet its job design lends itself to being up close for optimal DPS. When the heavy AoE damage starts flying around, you can pretty much be certain that a Corsair is going to be the first one to hit the floor. This also makes a Corsair a pretty bad solo fighter, as if the nature of its phantom roll effects didn't make this apparent enough. The job design also feels contradictory when you consider the true shot trait, which gives you a bonus range damage when at the right distance, and a penalty when you're not. Consider that outside triple shot your best TP gain is through melee, and you get my point. Corsairs can also have trouble with enmity control, and can't shed their built up hate at will. Rangers have the means of doing this, but Corsairs don't, which will force you to slow down and bottleneck your damage output rather than tear hate off your tank and run the real risk of being flattened in a few hits. Before I get into the job breakdown, I should let you know that there's a recent and very well written guide up on the Auction House forum, which I recommend you follow up after this video. 
The author of this guide, Arislan, did a really good job on this, I think. He listed the effects of all the phantom rolls, discussed weapon options, and even went to the extent of putting up equipment sets to help guide players. He did such a good job, in fact, that he's even saved me putting up my own in this guide like I have with other jobs in the past. I've linked this guide in my video's description. Having said that, Arislan and I disagree on merit selection. Slightly. Group 1 is maxing out Phantom Roll Recast and Quick Draw Recast. I agree there, as those two abilities are central to the Corsair's job. Group 2 is where we differ. I have one merit in Snake Eye and one in Fold, just to unlock them. Both are great abilities, don't get me wrong, and I'll be sure to go into them later, but let me explain my reasoning. I went 3 out of 5 in Winning Street, add duration to my roll effects, but I have also maxed out Loaded Deck. Adding certainty to random dealers is valuable in my eyes, as it doesn't just help you, it helps your party. I'll elaborate later on in this guide. Wildcard's a Corsair's first SP, and it's a really good one. Wildcard rolls a number between 1 and 6, and has varying effects on you and your group depending on what it lands on. Landing on a 1 or a 2 will restore all non-SP abilities, and are the weakest effects you can get from using it. Landing on a 3 will do the same thing as 1 and 2, but will also give you 1000% TP. 4 will do the same as 3, but will also give you your maximum TP, 3000. 5 and 6 are the big ones. Landing on a 5 will restore all abilities, including level 1 SPs like Bolster and Mighty Strikes, and will also restore half of everyone's maximum MP. Scoring the highest number, a 6, will restore every single ability, both SPs, and will fully restore everyone's MP. Wildcard can't be reset by another Corsair in your group hitting a 5 or a 6. Neither can it usually reset itself, but job points invested into it will give it a 20% chance of doing just that when it lands on a 5 or a 6. It's a small chance of doing so, but if it happens, you've basically hit the jackpot. Phantom Rolls are the backbone of the Corsair, as it's the umbrella ability which houses all of its roll effects. Phantom Rolls have no casting time, as they're abilities which activate instantly. All share the same reuse timer under the Phantom Roll ability, and the duration can be extended through merits, job points, and equipment. Rolling is basically like Blackjack, except the busting threshold is 11 instead of 21. When you first roll, you'll get a number between 1 and 6, which will determine the initial potency of the effect. Hitting the double up ability afterwards will make you roll again, increasing the total and the effect as you work your way towards 11, or as close to it as you can get without going over. Every roll has a lucky and an unlucky number between 2 and 10, which either gives it a strong effect or a weak effect. The specific numbers are listed alongside each roll in the menu. The strongest effect a roll can have will always be from a perfect roll, 11, so don't go beyond that. If you push your luck too much and go beyond 11, you'll be hit with a status ailment called Bust. Busting reduces the maximum number of phantom roll effects you can have active on yourself by 1, then also hits you with a penalty effect the polar opposite of what buff your roll would have given you. So, if you bust on Chaos Roll, you'll be hit with an attack down penalty until the bust effect wears off. If you bust once, it's not necessarily game over, as you still have slots available. You can still perform your roll and put two roll effects on your party, but you will only get the one effect while the bust is active. It's when you bust twice that you might be in trouble, as that stops you from rolling anything until the effect wears off, or if you remove the bust penalty yourself. If you have an 11 roll active, you'll also be immune to the bust penalty. The easiest way to remove a bust penalty is to use Fold. Fold instantly erases the roll or bust effect you have active with the longest duration. Fold will always target a bust over an active roll, so you don't need to worry about it targeting the wrong thing. Fold can get you out of some tricky situations, especially when you double bust, but you need to be aware that it has a 5 minute reuse timer, so if you don't have wildcard or random deal around to restore it, you might want to keep hold of it until you're in really dire straits. If you have 5 out of 5 merits in Fold, as well as the Relic Hands, Fold will erase both of your effects, which can actually work against you if you have one bust and one roll, as it'll get rid of both and potentially screw you over. I'd keep Fold at one merit for this reason. Snake Eye is the only way you can really stack luck in your favour by removing the element of chance. Snake Eye forces your next roll to be a 1, which is great for either moving off an unlucky number without busting, or for moving from a 10 to an 11. If you have more than one merit in Snake Eye, it'll have a chance of rolling the exact number you need to go to 11, if your current total is 5 or higher. So you could technically go from 5 straight to 11. Another trick with Snake Eye, especially when using rolls with 9 as their unlucky number, is to hit Snake Eye, use Wildcard or Random Deal to restore Snake Eye, roll to 10, then hit Snake Eye again to hit 11. Quick Draw fires a bullet at your target charged with the elemental energy of special cards. 
Like Ninja, rather than carrying around cards for each shot, you can just use master cards called trump cards to save on space. Quickdraw expends the card used, but not the bullet, so feel free to use the Animiki bullet in your set. Quickdraw ignores most forms of damage taken reduction, and completely bypasses its semi-shadows. Quickdraw shots give TP to the Corsair, it can actually hit pretty hard if geared properly. You have two charges of Quickdraw, which recharge one at a time, so you can either fire twice in a row for quick TP gain, or stagger them if you're saving them for specific reasons. Beyond doing damage, Quickdraw also has a lot of utility. Lightshot doesn't do damage, but what it can do is sleep targets. What makes Lightshot valuable is that it's a light elemental sleep, which means it'll work on monsters which heavily resist or are completely immune to dark elemental sleep spells. Darkshot, on the other hand, is a simple dispel. It's generally not worth using a quick draw charge on it, provided there's another person in the group who can cover the responsibility, but it's there in the event you need it. Another feature of Quick Draw is that it enhances the effects of enfeebling magic spells if a shot of the corresponding element is fired shortly after the spell has landed. Light Shot can be used to turn Dia 2 into Dia 3, and Dia 3 into Dia 4 for example. Unfortunately, it won't work with Distract or Frazzle. Why this is exactly, I don't know. I just guess that Square Enix thought that those spells were too strong as they were. Quick Draw's last utility is that whenever it's used with the Empyrean Boots, it boosts the damage of the next magic attack by 20%, the element boosted depending on the shot used. 25% may seem like a small number, but keep in mind it's a direct increase to damage much like a Rune Fencer's Gambit. It only works for the next magic attack before wearing off, but sometimes that may be all you need. Also, unfortunately the effect won't work with Darkshot and Leaden Salute, unless Darkshot actually dispels something. Random Deal is a mini wildcard in that it can restore a random job ability timer, or completely fail to take effect if it targets an ability waiting to be used. That bears repeating, Random Deal can sometimes do absolutely nothing and miss, but you can weigh the odds of it not doing so in your favour. To do so, you need to merit Loaded Deck, and, as I personally recommend, max it out. Loaded Deck forces Random Deal to ignore abilities which are already waiting to be used. Combined with job points and the relic body, random deal stands a very good chance, a 90% chance to be exact, of resetting two abilities in one shot. The applications of this are immense. You can reset crooked cards, more on that in a moment, and use it twice in a row. You can reset a Geomancer's Entrust and Blaze of Glory, a Warrior's Warcry and Blood Rage, or perhaps above all, a Bard's Troubadour and Nightingale. This is why I maxed out Loaded Deck. Crooked Cards is a Corsair's answer to a Bard's Mercado, in that it increases the effect of your next roll by 20%. Crooked Cards will usually be let down by its lengthy reuse timer, making it difficult to be used with two rolls in a single fight, but Random Deal could be aimed squarely at resetting it if done properly. Some rolls get more out of Crooked Cards than others. You simply add times 1.2 to the end of the calculation to get your new figure. I've listed some of the possibilities here. As you can see, Chaos Roll gets a lot out of Crooked Cards, as it's a percentage increase, as does Samurai Roll, because more store TP never hurt anyone. <laughs> I say that because all of the Corsair's best weapon skills scale damage with TP, so TP Overflow will add a lot of DPS. Triple Shot does exactly what it says. It gives you a chance of firing three bullets in one ranged attack until the ability wears off. The base rate is 40%, increasing to 60% with job points, and further increased to upwards of 80% with equipment stacked on top of that. Triple Shot will greatly increase your TP gain whenever you're fighting at a distance, but there's a few problems with it. Firstly, the reuse timer of Triple Shot is long, so you'll have to use your ability restores to try and get it back if the fight is drawn out. But since your ability restores are typically reserved for your rolling abilities, this likely won't be an option, unless you're very fortunate. Secondly, Triple Shot will burn through your bullets really fast, so you need to make sure that you've got enough to hand. I personally carry at least two stacks of bullets at all times. Thirdly, well, I really need to save the third for its own section later on because it's part of a wider problem. I'll get to it later. Cutting Cards is of course their second SP. Cutting Cards reduces the reuse timer of SPs of either yourself or of a targeted party member based on the number it lands on. 
At its weakest and with job points invested, it'll reduce the timer by 25%, while at its best, it'll reduce it by 70%. Cutting cards will affect both SPs if used on a party member, but it'll only affect wildcard if it's used on yourself. Then again, this is what I primarily use cutting cards for anyway, as wildcard can outright restore all SPs regardless. To kick off the tip section, it's best to start with some tricks to rolling. By itself, the radius of phantom roll is pretty small, but it can be doubled through the use of a JSC piece called Luzaf's Ring. Luzaf's Ring is in my rolling set, but sometimes you don't always want it on, because if you're doing rolls on your back line and your front line, you run the risk of getting your lines crossed and getting your buffs mixed up if your radius is doubled. Luzaf's Ring is pretty easy to get, you just need superior private rank in Arto Gun and 4000 Imperial Standing to buy it. The second ring you should be using in your rolling set is the Baratari ring. The ring does the phantom roll what the Dunna does to geomancy spells, in that it boosts their effects quite a bit. The ring can be bought off the auction house for a small cost, and it absolutely should be your first investment when you hit level cap on Corsair. Sure, the Baratari ring is beaten by the Regal Necklace for Moment, and it doesn't stack with the Regal Necklace, but it's a lot more likely that new players starting off will be getting the ring, so I figured I'd point it out in case they didn't know about it. Now here's something I see catching people out a lot. Like I mentioned earlier, you need to remember that each roll has a lucky and an unlucky number. I've seen countless people double up off of a roll's lucky number, only to land on its unlucky number, and then double up again to move off the unlucky number, to bust and end up looking like an idiot. I've got two tips here actually. The first is to not hit double up immediately after you first roll, and to wait and see what your first number is, as you may actually hit the lucky number right away. The second is to make an echo line in each roll's macro which reminds you what the lucky and unlucky numbers are so you don't forget mid-use. It's really simple and it will save you a lot of trouble. There's a reason that rolls have the names of a job's artifact set. It's because that's the game's way of giving you a hint that a roll is boosted further by that job being present in your party. This isn't stated anywhere in Phantom Roll's ability description so it's something new players could probably miss. Chaos Roll gets an extra boost if a Dark Knight is in your party, Samurai Roll gets a boost if a Samurai is with you, Evoker's Roll for a Summoner, and the list goes on. Job specific boosts to rolls also work with trust NPCs, provided you know what their jobs are when you call them. The job does not have to remain in the party to maintain the bonus, so once you've used the rolls you can dismiss the trusts and get your proper ones out. Rolls can also have a 50% chance of getting the bonus even without the job being present if the relic head is used during the roll. The exception to this rule are the roles which have no job specific bonuses attached to them, specifically the high level ones like tacticians, allies and casters. Those roles get their bonuses from different pieces of the Empyrean set. The really high level roles like companions and avengers get no bonus, which is a shame really. Perhaps I'll add it to the reforged Empyrean. Here's how you can get roles on both your front line and your back line. This is a pro move to do whenever you're preparing for a big fight, but you're going to need an 11 on your first roll to pull this off, so it's not guaranteed to work, and you're also going to want to leave Luzaf's ring out of this. Move over to where your frontline jobs are and do your best to roll a perfect 11, which will reset your roll timer and give you an immunity to busting. Then, run over to your backline jobs and do a roll which they need, whether it's refresh, fast cast, or something else entirely. When you get a good number, or better yet another 11, if you have the time and luck to try it, Run back to your frontline jobs and bust that roll on purpose. You'll lose the roll's effect, but your backline won't, since you went out of range of them before busting it on purpose. You can repeat this again for your backline if they need a second roll from you. When you're done, go back to your frontline and do the final roll on them. You've now done two rolls on your backline, and two on your frontline. You can also drop from your party when forcing the bust, if you simply don't have the room to move around, and you want to erase that particular roll from yourself. Triple Shot's third problem isn't so much a problem with the ability specifically, but rather with the nature of ranged attacks, distance damage correction, and the true shot trait. Ranged attacks, ranged weapon skills included, are all subject to a game mechanic called distance damage correction, which adjusts your damage and accuracy depending on the weapon you use and your relative distance from your target. Put simply, it means you can't fire at point blank range and get the same damage as you would when far away. You may notice that you occasionally get messages in your log about a ranged attack hitting squarely or striking true. This indicates that in the case of the former that you're almost at the perfect spot for optimal damage. 
and in the latter, you're absolutely spot on. Here's the major problem though. Have you spotted it yet? Distance damage correction works differently for different range weapons. So while a ranger's longbow is far away from its target, a gun's is pretty much point blank range. This is the problem, and it's a big one. Look how close I am to Tailmoth in this clip, and see that I'm getting hit with all of his AoE attacks. Optimal damage from correction and the true shot bonus demands that I stand this close to Tailmoth for my best range damage. If I don't, I'm actually hit with a damage penalty. Corsairs have very thin defenses, and a strong AoE attack can easily one-shot them, especially when caught in a mid-shot set. This is what I meant by the job's design being contradictory. It generally uses ranged weapon skills as its best form of damage, yet if you're meleeing, you're firing at point-blank range as well, so you're getting the penalty for doing so. If you step back a few paces to shoot, your TP gain is slower outside triple shot, and you're still in range of dangerous attacks. Rangers seldom have to deal with this, but Corsairs have to deal with it a lot. It feels like such an odd design choice on the developer's part. As I've done in all my previous guides, I'll showcase a few solo skill chains. What makes a Corsair skill chains different from anything else I've shown before is that they incorporate two different weapon types in the same skill chain, as a Corsair's marksmanship weapon skills can't cover all the categories necessary for a lengthy chain. Savage Blade can hit really hard with enough extra support, and especially if you're using the Magian TP bonus gun with it. Savage Blade is probably the most important weapon skill for you to quest, you should really go out of your way to get it. Last Stand is your go-to weapon skill when looking for physical damage from your gun. It has an 85% agility modifier, its FTP transfers across both of its shots, and weapon skill damage greatly boosts its overall damage. That it links with Savage Blade, twice if using the Fummel Horn, only makes it better. You can use Fire Shot before Hot Shot to amp it up a bit. Hot Shot's a bit of an odd weapon skill, I'll need to go into it in more detail later on. Leaden Salute is a Corsair's strongest weapon skill, and it hits especially hard if it's used as a closer in a multi-step chain. Leaden Salute has a 100% agility modifier, and its damage is pushed even further by adding weapon skill damage, magic attack bonus, and darkness affinity equipment like the pixie hairpin and the archon ring. Since it's unaffected by physical attributes, it's worth using allies roll over chaos roll when Leaden Salute is your main source of damage, and especially if you're skill chaining with it. You can do this solo and with no other support around, but it's when you start adding Geomancer and Red Mage spells that Leaden Salute starts getting absurd. Leaden Salute also scales damage the higher your TP is when you fire it, almost tripling its FTP between 1000 and 3000. Most endgame guns can get good damage from Leaden Salute, but the best two are the Fommel Hort and above that the Death Penalty. Until you get either of those two, the Molly Dosis will serve you well for Leaden Salute. Leaden Salute isn't the only strong elemental weapon skill Corsair has though. Wildfire may not reach the same high numbers as Leaden, but it does have things going for it. Unlike Leaden, Wildfire can sell skill chain, and can even be used to extend a darkness skill chain Leaden's made. It also suppresses the enmity generated from the damage it deals, and it can be powered up through Fire Shot to increase its damage a lot easier than Leaden can through Dark Shot. If the monster you're fighting resists darkness damage, then there's a good chance it won't resist fire damage, as it's on the opposite end of the elemental wheel. In these situations, wildfires are a really good fallback. The last thing I think I should talk about is Hotshot. Hotshot is the first marksmanship weapon skill you'll ever get, but it can actually be one of your strongest. Hotshot is a hybrid weapon skill, and if you watch my ninja guide you should know how they work. Hotshot follows the same rules as other hybrid weapon skills, but it can be boosted through fire shot, so you can see some pretty insane damage from it. Hotshot seems a little bit unreliable though, I'm not sure what it is about it, but its damage seems to fluctuate a lot, even for a hybrid weapon skill. The ideal hotshot set would be a mashup of your wildfire and your last stand sets. Give it a go sometime.
I'll wrap this guide up here. I think I covered the key bases and gave an insight into how the Corsair works in the current game. I might end up doing something slightly different for my next lengthy video, something that's been requested for quite some time now. Next up though should be my Q&A video. I'll aim to have that out sometime next week. I'll see you then.